here to take it to heart along with everything else and it's counterintuitive every time I read it it seems backwards in my mind I would rather go to a party a Christmas party right and have fun and play games and enjoy each other and those are good things God is not against those things he's for those things but in a house of mourning like this, it opens our heart and our mind to reflect in ways that are very important. So this is time well spent. So thank you for honoring Jesus, honoring Pat with your presence. But now let's join together and pray as we take it to heart. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you we're grateful for the life of 
Pat and the many, many people she breathed life into, particularly her kids and her grandkids and her husband and close friends. I just pray your spirit would dwell with us as we reflect and as we, we mourn and as we grieve. But ultimately, we grieve as people with hope. So we dedicate this time to you. And we're grateful for your spirit's presence. And we're grateful for Pat's faith in your son, Jesus Christ, which gives us the perfect assurance that she is with you right now. So be with us through this time. And bless uh, this time. And bless the family as they reflect and remember. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to hear from a couple members of the family, and John, your son John, is going to go first. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I, don't, I can't even look out there. I have no idea how I'm going to do this, but I just wanted to just say a few things about my mom. Um, Susan, I'm going to tell you the things she's going to miss about her. That was, I'm sure, is endless. But I just, I'm about to tell you that my mom, she loved everybody. She never said anything, anything bad about anybody. And she found the good in everybody. She was kind, she was loving, and she was a fun person. And after talking to everybody here today, They've all confirmed that. <clears throat> she hated to be alone. She got used to it after my dad passed away almost 20 years ago. She loved to write. She wrote our kids, she, all her kids' letters every year. Especially at Christmas. She had a knack for making them all cry in those letters. It was always good things, but I don't think I ever got through a letter without crying. She always, always told us she loved us, and that reflects on us as well, because that's what we do with our kids, and our kids do the same with us. She found a file after she passed away when I was cleaning out her condo, and she had so many letters that she had written to us and that a lot of the stuff in it I'd already known but I think she was very disappointed that her folks had passed away at such a young age. And she was very intent on us knowing about her family and what they were like. I never knew my grandpa or grandma on that side of the family but I felt like I did because she was always telling us stories about her, them. She had included in those letters to us. <laughs> she had always included these letters that were written to us, and I knew these, I knew all this because she had told me this many, many a times. I talked to people today said the same thing, that she loved to talk about her family, even though they, she was with them for such a short time. Her mom and dad both passed away before she turned 18, and she was very, very sad about this, and she said this in her letters that she wrote. But even more sad, she was sad that her kids didn't get to know her, grandpa her their grandparents. She was always sure to make us aware of how much she was loved by her mom, her dad, her brother that raised her after she, after her mom and dad passed away, her sister-in-law, her stepmom, and her stepsisters, and all of her family. She wanted to know, us to know that despite losing her parents early in life, everybody around her made her feel 
her life was as normal as possible, and it was not. But what's normal? She wanted us to know that her dad was funny and caring, and everybody thought of her dad as a neat person, despite having issues of his own, being an alcoholic. She remembers her mom, loving to do things with her, and just plain being with her. She said she taught her to sew, and she taught her to love. I truly believe this because she became such a loving and good mom from all the love that she had when she was a, when she was a child. But most of all, mom was a good Christian lady that loved the Lord. She prayed for everybody. She prayed every day for her kids, for her grandkids, and all that were in her life. And I tell you, if you're here today, your paths well, most likely crossed, and I can promise you that she prayed for each and every one of you in this room. Her was so important to my mom. I love her with all my heart. I will miss her here on earth, and her mem but her memory should be with me. I know I'll see her again. I love you, Mom. She always expressed her thankfulness for her three children. She used to ask, and she used to ask me, what would I do if I didn't have the three? Um, but I felt like we were the lucky ones, we were the blessed ones um, to have her as our mother. Um, and my mom was more than my mother, she was my best friend. Um, that being said, I compiled a list of some things that I miss about my best friend. Um, number one is, um, our, actually I didn't number one, but there's ten. But there's many more. Um, hour long conversations on the way to work, hour long conversations on the way home from work, shopping at JCPenney with her discount, <laughs> sleepovers at my mom's house or hers, and getting early up early to have coffee and talk, Christmas love letters, um, birthday cards every year with our birth story, a tradition I have continued with my own children that they love and look forward to every year. Our ism talks, such as I've had three me meter in my kitchen. That was the kitchen. Um, and ha, a lobster. Bethany reminded me of mowing with today. Um, her constant optimism. When I complained growing up that someone was stuck up, my mom always said, Maybe she's just shy. <laughs> um, uh, the sense of relief that I had that everything was going to be okay if I could just tell my mom. And the constant reminders um, to be careful every time I left her because there's drunks on the road. My mother was my constant encouragement, my greatest friend, and my top faith. I love you, Mom. Hello, everybody. My name is Faith Faber.
Thank you for sharing. It's hard to compress a life in a few minutes, isn't it? That was worth hearing, so thank you. I want to take a few minutes and spend a little time in the Word. And I'm going to read from book of 1st Thessalonians 4. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church, a group of people, and he, in the middle of this letter, or near the end, he says this. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is 
what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I first met Pat almost 20 years ago. I was at work, and Pat had contacted the church. Her and Steve had just moved into the area. And Steve was in the last stages of this battle with cancer. And so I went with uh, my colleague, Tim Point, and um, I met Steve and met Pat. And Steve was, <laughs> I just couldn't believe, they were both so upbeat and very godly in our conversation and very clear that he knew within days he was going to pass away, and he did. And then Pat came to make this her church home. And so for years, I would regularly see Pat and sometimes chat with her and just always say hi or exchange a word, and sometimes we'd talk a little longer. I, like everybody else, <laughs> we just love her. She, she was perky in all the good ways. And she was just always upbeat, always positive, uh, always encouraging, always encouraging to me personally, always asking for something to pray about. And she was the type of person when she asked you for something to pray about, you knew she was going to pray. And she was friends with my mom, and um, she was just a delight, just very life-giving in this place, as well as many others. Originally, I was just going to read the second part of this text, but when I was reading uh, kind of the whole text, the part I started with, I added, because it reminded of me, of Pat. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed so you may walk properly before outsiders. Pat Faber <laughs> lived that out. She was not a notice me person at all, but she would seek you out and if she had something to say to, to encourage you or give you life, she would make sure she did that. She would be missed in this place as well as many others. He also said at the start of that, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And I just love hearing the kids and grandkids her, it's the greatest thing she could have given you, right? And you guys see how dear it is, and, and so you pass it on, and Christ is at the center. So even in your grief, you're an encouragement to, to all of us. 
want to take a little time to talk about um, the rest of the part I read, and I'm not going to get into every bit of theology there. Um, I just want to take two words that Paul says. <clears throat> And he says that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And in that little phrase, he gives us two very powerful and important concepts, grief and hope. And it's universal that we all go through grief and we all have different hopes. And so what is... Paul talking about who are the people who have no hope and what is this grief of what he speaks. So in this vocation, you end up over the years doing and being part of and going to a lot of different funerals. And the experiences with grief range greatly. A sudden death of a young person that's unexpected. It just brings an unprecedented and unexpected type of grief that overwhelms many people. But if somebody has lived quite a while and time has taken its toll on their health, there's a grief, but there's also a hope that the person will be relieved relieved of what they're going through physically. So I try and think about grief in, in its totality. What is grief? And it seems to me that the world, we don't just have individual grief. We will enter individual grief. But when individual grief comes to us, it seems to me like we're entering into a grief that is always ongoing. Because there's people every moment of every day somewhere in the world, there's grief all along the spectrum of grief going on. But it's when things happen that are near to us that we grieve. But we just don't grieve, we enter collective grief that's ongoing. And grief seems to be kind of the collective human sadness at the unrelenting decay of life. So grief can happen at the moment of death, but the reality is there's a lot of little grief all along the way through life. I'm 59. There are things that I could do at 29, that I can't do today, or I can't do as well. And yeah, I don't sit down and ball over it, but I kind of miss it. And that's a little bit of grief. And so we're, we're grieving all along the way because this decay is ongoing. It's, it's universal if we're, we're paying attention and, and Paul knows this, and he wants to, he's writing about something huge here, and he wants us to know grief is ongoing. You're going to become more aware of it at times, and, and when you do, because your faith is in Christ, you don't grieve without, have to grieve, and watch this decay of life go on, the way people do who don't have hope. Well, what does he mean then by people who don't have hope? And sometimes I'll be at a funeral that was very sudden and tragic, and, and I've, I've heard people say, I don't know how people go through this without Christ. But they do. And I've been at some of those funerals. Well, how do they do that. Well, you, you, you have a hope in something unspecified. You still have a hope. You just haven't articulated it. You, 
You haven't named it. You haven't given your life over to it. But in your mind, you, there's just this hope that it's going to all work out okay. And so we'll say all kinds of things to take that nebulous uh, hope and make it more real to us. So Paul isn't saying, oh, if you don't know Christ, you don't have hope. What he's saying is the only hope that really lasts is the hope in Christ. So there's kind of two kinds of, of hope. There's the hope that we sure hope the future turns out this way. So this past weekend, I came home. We had candlelight services here. The first one was uh, in the morning, and when I got home, uh, my oldest son, he's a big soccer fan. So I get home, and he, they're halfway through the finals of the World Cup. Anyone watch that? And I'm like, hey, look at you, bud. And he's really in the messy in Argentina. And so I'd watch a little. I might run upstairs and get something or do something. All of a sudden, they hear this hollering from downstairs. So, yeah. And he's going up and down, up and down. And he's just hoping that at the end, Argentina wins. You know? and there's a bunch of other people around the world hoping France wins, right? And this is a hope, but, that no, but nobody knows what's going to happen until it happens. That's not what Paul is talking about here. And sometimes, all the time, when people don't have Christ, when grief comes, if you don't have Christ, you're left with, that's the kind of hope you have. It's the hope of, I've got to wait for the future to happen for me to know what's really going to happen. I just hope it works out in a way I can. Paul's not talking about that kind of hope. Paul's, there's only one real kind of hope that matters, and Paul's telling us about hope that is certain hope. It's a hope in the future that you know is going to happen. And so your faith is anchored in a future that will happen. That's what it means to have hope in Christ. So over the years, you know, when I was younger, I'd, I'd think about this, okay. You hope in Christ, but, but what's different about Hope in Christ versus, oh, uh, hope in, in, in some universal God. Uh, everything's God. Or there's, uh, there's hope in Allah. Or, or, or just hope in, in, in uh, there being just a pure light at the end of the day. What, 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 what's different about hoping in Christ? Why should, I, why should I be compelled to put my hope in Christ versus these other types of hope. What makes it more sure? Well, certainly it takes faith, but it isn't a faith in choosing one among equals. It's like, oh, there's 20 different versions you can put faith in, I'll take Jesus. That's as, as likely to happen as maybe some of these others, and that's what Christianity is. It's not what it is. You see, when you read scripture, and you really read it as if it's a story about reality, the way you, you, your parents read it. It's a story of reality. And it's going to tell you the truth about life. And you're going to experience life. You're going to look at this book. You're going to read this book. And then you're going to look at your life. And then the place you got to look the most is your own heart. So you read this book. You look at your own heart. You read what the book says about your own heart. And when I read what the book says about my heart, and then I examine my heart, I'm like, he nailed it. I do pretend I'm good, but deep down, I know I'm a sinner. Pat was a fabulous person. She's in the upper percentiles of enjoyable, life-giving people. But she knew she was a sinner and that she needed Christ. And so we reflect on her goodness, but the reason we honor Christ even above Pat is because she
seen you, that's the way you do it. It's, there's no other way. So you read the book, you, re, you think about your own heart, you think about this, the, what's going on in the world, and when he, Paul takes time to write about this grief and kind of this universal grief that's ongoing and everything's always decaying, and if I'm honest, I like to pretend it's not happening, but even my own life is, is decaying away in little bits and pieces, and sometimes it's physical, and sometimes it's a kid growing up and moving out, and those are good, it's a good thing, but you lose something. And then you realize you long for a world where that didn't have to happen. And the book tells us that. And then it begins to describe a world like that. And that's why when we encounter grief, we don't do it as people who don't know Christ. We do it in a way because of faith in Christ that allows us to feel sad, but to realize that grief and sadness and death do not get the final word. That's not the final word. Jesus gets the final word. It's him. He gets to say, death, you don't win. You think you won, but because she's my child, you don't get her. I do. I get her, and I love her. And that is where Pat is today because of her faith. So scripture lays it out in all kinds of ways, some of the more prominent ways or that people are familiar with are come from the book of Romans. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish will have everlasting life. And that's certain hope. There's uh, no um, putting our, our faith in that and then uh, wondering if that was really legit. There's certain hope. That's the hope Pat lived by. That's the hope Steve lived by. And that's the hope she wants to be made known, she made known in her life. And today, as we celebrate her life, she wants to make that known. And so we make it known. If you don't know Christ in this way, <coughs> you can do so today with sincere faith. But the, it's acknowledging we're a sinner, it's, it's acknowledging we deserve hell and that Christ is our only way to heaven because he's the one true son of the living God and he was resurrected and sincere faith in that is what gets us that certain hope and it's just a moment away but for many of us maybe all of us have already put our faith in Christ and Solomon still wants us to come here and be here together. And we'll take it to heart. And to think about a life well lived. Why do we admire her so much? Well, because she loved Jesus enough to allow it to shape her treatment of other people. From inside her house, her closest people, even people like me. Who would see her maybe once a week but that's what she did and so as we take it to heart 
Solomon wants us to know this is the end at some point in the future for all of us but what do we do between now and then do we live in certain hope or do we cling to the whole world of hope and so we gather we sit under the word and we encourage his last words of this section therefore encourage one another with these words I'm doing with you now. It's for you, it's for me. We encourage one another with these words. I want to read one more piece of scripture, and then we'll have a song, and then I'll close us in prayer. But it's a picture of the certain hope, and it comes from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's all take that to heart and let's choose, as Pat chose every day, to follow him. Surrounded by 